Hello, good evening all. My name is Dr. Uma Arman Lakatiki. I'm the Tana Women Services Coordinator. I'm excited to host this event on cancer awareness and lifestyle modification. Cancer is the la second largest leading cause of death. It not only affects the person, but the entire family. There are many myths about the cancer and it, its treatments. It is important to recognize the causes, treatment options, and ways to prevent it. One in eight women are affected by breast cancer, and October is the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We have two oncologists who will talk about risk factors, treatment, prevention in general, and specifically about the breast cancer. Before I begin the session, I request Tana President Sri Anjaya Chaudhary Laugaru to say a few words. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Omagaru. Can you hear me, Andy? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, Andy. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, first of all, excuse me, I was uh, not in a comfortable place, so it will be very brief. So, yeah, as Omagaru said, October is Cancer Awareness Month. First of all, I would like to thank Omagaru for coming up with this uh, you know, great uh, uh, webinar slash seminar, seminar. I know uh, cancer, obviously, it's one of the you know greatest uh, cause for our deaths in our uh, community recently, uh, especially Indian community. So the topic is need of the hour. So, and also I would like to thank, uh, especially the two hosts of today on college, Sadish Kotalagaru, who happened to be my friend as well. I know Sadish Garu for a long time. Srilata Gundalagaru and uh, uh, Murti Garu also. Of course, he's a well wish of Tana and uh, he has done many programs on Tana's platform. And entire Tana leadership who rendered their unconditional support. And the topics like, you know, what is, what is the, uh, you know, how we can prevent uh, and how we can modify our lifestyle uh, from this cancer. So this awareness session, as I mentioned, it's a need of the hour. So let us utilize this great opportunity. And of course, I want to recognize uh, Mid uh, Midwest uh, RR Hano uh, Cherukuri uh, and the entire team and overall national uh, Tana leadership team. Once again, uh, Uma Garu, you have done a great uh, job, many programs on Women's Front. And once again, wish you all the best. And you all have a good session. Uh, thank you, Andy. Please go ahead with the session. Thank you so much, Andy Anjay Garu, for constant support and encouragement. I would like to say thank you to the rest of the Thana leadership also. I would like to introduce Dr. Vemuri Murthy Garu, who will be moderating this session. Dr. Vemuri Murthy Garu is an affiliate faculty in emergency medicine at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. Visiting professor at Indian universities, including AIMS, he conducted, moderate, conducted and moderated several education programs for physicians and community members, as well in the USA and India for the past many years. Before giving the floor to Dr. Mutigaru, I request audience to type the questions if they have any in the chat box. At the end, the doctors will answer your questions. Thank you. Mutigaru, the floor is yours, Sunday. Thank you. Atana President, Anjay Chaudhary Laugaru, Women's Services Coordinator, Dr. Uma Katigaru, and other leaders of Tana present here. Thank you for inviting me to moderate this exclusive interactive workshop on cancers with a particular focus on breast cancer during the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I commend the commitment of Tana to reduce morbidity and mortality due to breast cancer, which is uh, the second most common cause of death, and other cancers too, through this uh, community-focused informative seminar involving two distinguished oncology experts. Only recently, I had a chance to work with both of them in one of the AAPI, Physician-Focused CME programs. We have come a long way in scientific advances in diagnosing and treating cancers, especially during the past decade, leading to enhanced outcomes in terms of longevity and quality of uh, the care. Regarding the format of today's program, both the speakers will spend about an hour on the cancer-related topics, 
we'll have about 30 minutes or so for the question and answer session. Our first speaker, Dr. Satish Katula, is a clinical professor of medicine at Wright State University, Ohio, and is a board certified oncologist and hematologist with 21 years of experience. And academicians of track record, he won many laurels from various professional organizations in the USA and India. Leukemia and Lymphoma Society has recognized him as the man of the year. He is the founder and chairman of Pathfinder Institute of Pharmacy Education and Research in Telangana. As a longtime leader of US Ethnic Organized Medicine, Dr. Katula is the current vice president of the RP. Welcome, Dr. Satish Katula. Our next, uh, the second speaker is Dr. Srilata Gundala. She is the founder of Hope and Healing Center Cancer Services in Chicago since 2018. She is an active member of the American Society of Oncology and board certified in internal medicine, hematology, and oncology. Dr. Gundala has expertise in benign and malignant hematology and general oncology with a particular interest in breast, lung, and GI malignancies, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. He is actually involved in community education on cancer, and he is a regular speaker at the University of Chicago Medicine Transplant and Cellular Therapy Program Advisory Board. She also participates in oncology workshops and roundtable discussions with colleagues in academia at the regional and national levels. We also welcome Dr. Srilatha Gundala. So our first speaker, Dr. Satish Kattula, will take over the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. I appreciate the opportunity, Umagaru, Anjay Garu, and all the committee members. Uh, it is a privilege uh, to talk to you all today. I'm going to talk about uh, cancer in general. Uh, what are the risk factors and uh, what is cancer? You know, what determines the outcome? So on and so forth. It's, it's a talk for you know, general population uh, who are not familiar with medical terminology. So I'll try to make it uh, as simple as possible. So let me share the screen. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay. We can, we can hear you loud and clear. All right. So let me uh, go back to the first slide. And uh, yeah, so what is cancer? Everybody asks us, you know, what is cancer? Basically, it's abnormal growth of cells due to loss of control over the growth, resulting in tumor formation. And uh, that has uh, potential, the tumors have potential to invade the surrounding structures and spread to different organs. That is the difference between a benign tumor and a malignant tumor or a cancer. The benign tumors do not spread. By definition, cancerous tumors spread distantly via lymphatics as well as through blood. So this is uh, basically um, you know, a picture showing you know, primary cancer, let's say in the colon, that can travel to brain or that can travel to lungs or other organs in the body. So here, the primary cancer is, you know, spreading through uh, the lymphatic channel. So that's a very basic uh, picture there. In the global cancer incidence, about 18 million new cancers are diagnosed worldwide every year. And out of which 21% of them are in Americas, North and South. 23.4% in uh, Europe, and almost half of these are in Asia. So because Asia is bigger and, and it's much more complex, many more risk factors, environmental pollution and all those things. Africa, 5.8%, and these are all the numbers. So these include actually non-invasive cancers too, especially in America, there are 3.7 million cases are diagnosed, 3.8 almost, but out of which, uh, more than half of them are non-invasive cancers, which are non-lethal. But more than uh, up to 2 million are potentially lethal cancers. So these are all uh, cancer deaths, uh, according to a study uh, in 2017. If you look at uh, lung cancer, it kills about uh, 1.88 million people, close to 2 million worldwide and followed by colon and rectal cancer, almost 900,000, and stomach cancer, 864,000, liver cancer, more than 800,000, breast cancer, 611,000 worldwide, then pancreatic, esophageal, 
prostate, leukemia, cervical, they all kill more than a quarter million people every year in the world. So this is the estimated age standardized incidence and mortality rates worldwide for both sexes and all ages. If you look at breast cancer, uh, it is uh, one of the most common cancers in women. And when you look at uh, the red line, which is the mortality. So when you look at uh, the incidence to mortality, majority of the patients with breast cancer survive. Same thing with prostate, not with lung. Majority of them die because lung cancer is much more aggressive. So colorectal, about 40% of them die from disease. So same thing, almost 30 to 40% die from cancer of the uterus. About 70% of them die from stomach cancer when they're diagnosed with that. And, uh, so just to give you some uh, you know, uh, magnitude of the cancer. So this is the probability of anybody developing cancer. Breast cancer, about 13%. 13% of the women develop breast cancer. That's one in eight. So that is a staggering number, actually. So same thing, prostate also is seen in about 12.5% of men. So lung cancer, the probability of developing lung cancer is about 6%. Colorectal is about 4%. Melanoma is about 3%. Uh, endometrial or uterus cancer is 3%. Urinary bladder, 2.4%. So the list goes on. So, and what is the probability of dying from cancer? So the lung cancer is the most common cause of cancer killer. It says the most common cause of cancer death, followed by breast, then prostate, colorectal, pancreatic, then ovarian, then leukemia. So these are all the probabilities of dying from these cancers. So I just want to, uh, you know, briefly, I mean, there are some uh, IT, some non-science uh, background uh, friends here. So we do have cells, billions of cells in our body. So this is a cell and every cell has a nucleus. Most of them do. There are some integrated cells, but majority of the cells do have nucleus. And nucleus has all these chromosomes and uh, chromosomes are made up of genes. And the you know, the function of the genes is to make protein. But in this process, if something goes wrong, what is called mutation, that leads to abnormal protein synthesis that can lead to cancer. So cancer is not, you know, an overnight thing. So it is a multi-step process and it occurs over a period of years. Not some of them can come on very quickly, but majority of the cancers are caused, you know, uh, they occur like over a period of years. For example, colon cancer, classic example. So some of them just come on so suddenly, such as acute leukemia and things like that. So there are multiple steps in carcinogenesis or cancer causation. So this is, you know, basically a slide showing that. So tumors are clonal expansions. So that means that from one abnormal cells, there are millions of cells that grow and that becomes the tumor at cancer. So they're called clonal expansions. They're called monoclonal cells. So what type of cancers uh, people can get? Uh, different types like carcinoma, which arises from what is called epithelial cells. Uh, for example, breast cancer um, in lung, colon, uh, any part of the GI tract, carcinomas are very common. Sarcomas arise from connective tissue, such as muscle tissue or bones. Melanoma comes from skin forming cells called melanocytes. Lymphomas arise from lymph nodes or lymph glands. Leukemias are basically cancer of blood cells. So these are all some basic types of cancers which we commonly see. So there is always a question, you know, hey, how do I know I have cancer? Everybody asks. Uh, so there are uh, you know, cancers which do not cause symptoms, they are asymptomatic completely, no symptoms whatsoever. But sometimes we see unexplained weight loss, painless lumps in the breasts or in the neck or under armpits. Some people may have new onset visual problems, new onset seizures or fits if they have brain cancer, brain tumors, bone pain if they have something called multiple myeloma, which is a bone marrow cancer, or anybody has sarcomas or metastasis to the bone, they may present with bone pain, sometimes changing molds, that's a sign of melanoma. So these are all non-specific symptoms. So, but if you have 
persistence of symptoms, if they last longer than usual, like, you know, few weeks or months, then you have to seek help. Uh, but anybody who has weight loss, you know, not necessarily they do have cancer. So uh, don't get scared, but you have to go to your doctor if it persists. Any bone pain is not cancer. So bone pain could be arthritis, bone pain could be inflammation, bone pain could be, you know, so many other reasons, but common things are common. But these are generally speaking, uh, people can present like this with these symptoms. So another thing, what determines uh, the outcome of a cancer? So cancer type. So whether it is lymphoma, leukemia, carcinoma, sarcoma, depends on the type of cancer. Stage also determines the outcome. The higher the stage, the worse will be the outcome. Organ, where it is coming from. For example, if it is breast or prostate, as you have seen, their five-year survival is really good as opposed to pancreatic cancer or lung cancer for the same stage, it is much worse. So it is not only the stage, but which type of cancer it is and where it is originating from. And the greater the cancer, we actually tell by looking under a microscope, uh, we do have what is called KI67 score, the pathologist grade cancer is grade one, two, three, four. So if it is fully differentiated, that is not good. So age, of course, is very important because age, you know, as we age, we have so many medical conditions like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and things like that. So that actually puts people at risk of having, you know, poorer prognosis than younger individuals. In general condition of the patient, what we call performance status is also very, very important. A 80 year old guy who is exercising an hour or two a day can do better than a guy who is 50 and not working out or not doing any exercise at all. And, and you know, it's, it's not only the age, but also the general condition of a person is important in determining, determining the outcome. So these are all the five year survival rates. Uh, uh, when you take uh, all comers, for example, prostate, these are all American Cancer Society statistics. Prostate cancer is about 98% five years survival rate. Thyroid, 98%. Testicular, 95%. Melanoma, including in situ, that's you know, non-invasive, 93%. Breast, 90%, including in situ. Hodgkin's lymphoma is about 88%. Uh, so the good news is that not everyone with cancer will die. So this is a, a misconception people have. All cancer patients die. No, that is not true. A lot of people who survive from cancer. So how is cancer treated? So typically surgery, for example, lung, breast, colon, pancreatic, those are all treated with surgery. And some of them are treated with radiation. For example, prostate can be cured with radiation alone. And there are some head and neck carcinomas which can be cured with radiation alone. And there are certain lymphomas which can be cured with radiation alone without any surgery or chemotherapy. It depends on the type, depends on the stage. And the chemotherapy, you know, there are so many types of chemotherapies we have. Oral chemotherapies, intravenous, which we give through IV, intra-arterial chemo, which we don't do commonly, intrathecal, which is injected into one's brain, intra-abdominal or intraperitoneal, which we do that in case of ovarian cancer or peritoneal carcinomatosis, intralesional in case of melanomas and things like that. So these are all type of, type of chemotherapies. Again, I just want to reiterate that all chemotherapies are not bad. There are a lot of patients who tolerate chemotherapy very well. There's a bad rap about chemotherapy. Oh, it causes you know, sickness and people really throw their guts out. So that is not true anymore because we do have a lot of supportive treatments. For example, when I started treating cancer patients 23 years ago, we used to admit patients to hospitals. But now, with the refinement of chemotherapy, with the newer uh, generation chemotherapy drugs, uh, and also, uh, you know, the anti-emetics or anti-nausea medications are improving, and we seldom see, you know, any nausea whatsoever with these medications. So the quality of life is also improving with the advancement of uh, cancer treatments and cancer supportive care. So now this is a buzzword, you know, targeted therapy. Uh, and, and a lot of people talk about this. Uh, and this is actually uh, targeting the particular mutation where a cell uh, has this, uh, you know, cancer causing mutation. 
So the, these drugs are kind of smart bombs where they act, you know, where the mutation is actually, and uh, thereby they spare normal cells. Chemotherapy kills all the cells because it is very non-specific. So it kills good cells and bad cells. But whereas targeted therapy specifically attacks the cells which have mutation. So these are being used more commonly now in case of lung cancer, in case of breast and uh, even colorectal too. So there are more targeted treatments. And that's a revolution in case of leukemias. For example, chronic myelogenous leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, we do have much more refined treatments nowadays. So immunotherapy, where you know these therapies actually increase your immunity, they actually awaken your T cells, which are needed to protect you from cancer. So these immunotherapies actually wake up your T cells so that you can fight cancer better. So the immunotherapies are also uh, becoming more and more uh, common treatments. And now immunotherapies have 40 different indications. We, we treat uh, 40 different cancers and 40 different types of cancers with immunotherapy nowadays. So uh, the indications are actually growing every day. And they are very well tolerated uh, when compared to chemotherapy, the target treatments and immunotherapies are much better tolerated. So what about prevention? You know, uh, uh, you know we do have some screening procedures. Uh, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So we always stress really well on these preventive measures because you don't want to go into that phase where you have stage three, four, where you need all these treatments. So if you can prevent it at a very early stage before it starts, uh, to invade other organs. So your survival is much better. Your treatments will be much more tolerable. So mammograms for women who are, you know, more than 40. After you turn 40, get a mammogram done. Chronoscopy after the age of 45 years. Again, there are some exception, exceptions. If you have family history, you may need screening earlier. So you need to talk to your physician about that. PSA, which is kind of controversial, which is prostate-specific antigen. Actually, this is for detecting prostate cancer, but this is not the standard of care, but uh, people do that just to uh, screen for prostate cancer. It is not as good as others because we do see a little bit of elevation even though there is no cancer. So, um, And those who have smoking history, if they smoked one pack for 30 years or two packs for 15 years, that's called 30 pack year smoking history or more, we do a CT scan of the chest, low dose, uh, to detect early stage cancers. And uh, how can we prevent lifestyle changes? That is a big thing I'm gonna talk about today. So there are two kinds of risk factors in cancer. One is non-modifiable risk factors, which we are born with. There are modifiable risk factors, which are basically lifestyle related. So what are non-modifiable risk factors? For example, age. Age is not reversible, right? So you all know age is the biggest risk factor for cancer. So if you look at this graph, this is 400,000 people. If you look at people who are you know, 80, 85, the, they have highest incidence of cancer because people are undergoing, you know, a lot of mutations. You know, you, when you grow older, your cells also grow older and then there is no repair mechanism. Your DNA is not as strong as when you are young. And that's what causes, you know, more mutations, less stability. And that is the reason why people develop cancers as they age. So age is the most common risk factor, and it is the most non-modifiable non risk factor. All right, so then what are the other non-modifiable risk factors in cancer? Genetic or family history is also, uh, but uh, contrary to the belief, only 15 to 20% are genetic, 80% are environmental or sporadic. So people are exposed to radiation, chemicals, pesticides, without knowing. For example, when you are young, you may be growing in a farm, you're exposed to pesticides and chemicals if you're working in a factory, and exposure to radiation. We do see this 
uh, all the time. And there is so much of radiation, uh, you know, in the air. If you are uh, living close to a nuclear plant, or if you are a pilot, you know, you are exposed to cosmic radiation. So those are all the things that you you cannot control so much. Autoimmune disorders, for example, people who have lupus, people who have rheumatoid arthritis, because their immunity is altered. That's why they cannot really, uh, you know, they do not have good immune surveillance for cancer. That's why they develop cancers. Low immunity for any uh, reason, for example, HIV patients uh, are uh, more prone to develop cancers because they do not have immunity. Immunity is not only needed to fight infections, but also cancer, the T-cell immunity we call. And people who are taking immunosuppressives, uh, for example, transplant patients, liver transplants or kidney transplants, they are on long-term immunosuppressives to prevent what is called graft versus host disease. And they do develop cancers more than uh, people who are not on them. So smoking is one of the demodifiable risk factors. And I call it the true weapon of mass destruction. So that is true because it kills millions of people worldwide, not only by cancer, but also by causing coronary artery disease, heart attacks, strokes, and other things, uh, COPD, lung damage, and things like that. So there are at least, at least 12 types of cancers which are caused by smoking. You know, the voice box cancer, mouth cancers, what is what we call head and neck, you know, esophageal, pancreatic, lung, stomach, kidney, bladder, you name it, almost all of them, you know, are caused by smoking. So smoking is very, very bad. So if you smoke, today is the day to quit after looking at this slide. It is very, very important. And uh, smoking not only causes cancer, but also if patients continue to smoke, after cancer uh, occurs, even the treatments don't work as good as non-smokers. So that's why it is never too late to quit. So the smoking can interfere with cancer treatments and uh, people who continue to smoke develop more cancers in future, even if they are cured of one cancer. So that's very important to remember. So what about alcohol, which is also one of the lifestyle things. So people drink, oh, I only drink two or three drinks a day and you know nothing will happen. No, that's not true. Uh, people who drink develop cancers, uh, which is very well known. Studies have shown again and again that uh, the head and neck cancers, the mouth, throat, voice box, esophageal, which is the food pipe, breast cancer, liver, colon and rectum, cancers are caused by alcohol. So about 13% uh, of cancers are related to alcohol actually. So same thing with alcohol too. When somebody develops cancer, if somebody continues to drink, their survival is not as good as, as non-drinkers. Also, they develop more cancers in the future. So this is a diagram. You know, this is basically the, um, you know, the metabolism of the alcohol. Whenever somebody drinks, there is something called alcohol dehydrogenase, and that converts alcohol into acetaldehyde, which is the carcinogen. And there is something called ALDH, that's an enzyme that actually, you know, further metabolizes acetaldehyde. If somebody has defect in ALDH, or if they're drinking more, there is more accumulation of this acetaldehyde, which is a chemical, and that can cause, you know, mistakes in DNA, uh, chromosomal changes, and that is very, very, um, you know, carcinogenic, uh, cancer causing. So that's why it is better to limit alcohol or even quit completely and not drinking is even better. So what about diet? You know, uh, we don't uh, really talk about diet so much, but diet is also very, very important risk factor because this has been proven in multiple studies that people who uh, eat meats, especially red meats, have very high incidence of uh, cancers, especially colorectal cancers, breast cancers. So these are all uh, very important to remember. So especially processed food, processed meats like you know hot dogs, sausage, uh, pepperoni, bacon. These are all very very uh, you know carcinogenic, and it's better to avoid these things if you can. And uh, you know especially uh, the first generation Indians don't eat these, but our kids. 
are very used to American diet. So tell your kids not to eat these things because they not only cause cancer, but they are very bad for your heart because there is so much of fat in them. So it's not good for anything. I know some people argue that, oh, where do we get protein from? But for protein, there are so many other things. Whey protein, soy protein, those things. Don't have to get protein from meats. So this is, uh, you know, uh, what is called the uh, International uh, Organization on uh, Cancer Research. And uh, they actually, you know, group them into uh, different categories. Uh, the group one, which definitely causes cancer, which is proven. So like I said, processed meat, like salami, bacon, sausage, and hot dogs. And then pork, beef, lamb, they probably can cause cancer. They are grouped under group 2A. And then some people say chicken, poultry, you know, uh, and eggs. Uh, they are, the risk is not known with them, but uh, some studies have shown very weak link. But the processed meat is the worst one followed by pork, beef, and lamb. And it's not only the meat, but also how we prepare meat is also important. If you grill like this, you know, it produces a lot of uh, polycarbons, which are carcinogenic. So it's not only processed, number one, it is meat. Number two, it is processed. And number three, you're grilling it uh, to perfection, you know, to, to char grill, what they call. It's, it's a fancy word, right? It is bad because it produces more carcinogens and it's much more carcinogenic. So for that reason, so it's better to avoid all these things. So, so definitely, I mean, there are so many studies that I can quote, uh, which uh, showed, uh, you know, increased incidence of cancer, colorectal cancers and breast cancers and things like that. So, but uh, people who take, uh, you know, vegetables and fruit have low incidence of cancer. So you can replace these meats with fruit. And, and uh, the cancer risk has gone down by up to 25% in those who eat fruit and vegetables regularly. So it is proven in studies. So that's why it is never too late to switch. So diet is very, very important, not only for cancer, but other diseases. For example, diabetes, you know, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, strokes, heart attacks. So what about physical activity? So decreased physical activity is associated with increased risk of cancer. That is also very uh, much studied, proven. So there are increased circulating levels of insulin, other hormones, and uh, the impact on prostaglandin levels and altered immune function. And 14% of the cancer deaths are related to sedentary lifestyle. That's a staggering number. 14% of cancer deaths are due to lack of physical activity. So that's an independent risk factor. It's not because people are obese or anything. Even if you are lean, non-fat, but if you're not really exercising, if you, are, if you don't have physical activity, 14% of the people die due to lack of activity you know, with cancer. So what kind of physical activity can we do or, or what kind of uh, cancers are associated with low physical activity? You know, all kinds, including esophageal, breast, lung, kidney, stomach, bladder, colorectal, endometrial. So there is very strong evidence with all these, except for lung. So that's why people have to, you know, be active physically. So uh, can increase in physical activity reduce cancer risk mortality? Yes. There's about 24% risk reduction in colon cancer. And several studies have shown that colon cancer and all that can be uh, you know, you can improve survival in those patients as well, colon and breast too. Uh, the general recommendation is 30 minutes of exercise three times a week and resistance exercise at least twice weekly. And if you do more, that's even better. There is no, uh, you know, higher limit. As much as your body can tolerate, do it. So, and what kind of activity, any kind of activity can be helpful in cancer reduction. Uh, for example, biking, you know, swimming, running, uh, or walking, swimming, and, and, and you know, you can just take your dog for a walk for a mile or two. That is also considered physical activity. It's not cardio. Cardio is different. If you do cardio, that can help both cardio as well as cancer risk. But if you are trying to reduce cancer risk only, any of these activities will be enough. So, but the more vigorous you do, the better it is for many other things.
So what about obesity? A lot of people are not aware of this risk factor. And if you're overweight, you are more prone to get cancers. A lot of people don't talk about that. A lot of people don't even know about this. And there are at least 13 cancers which are caused by overweight or obesity. So that's very important to know. So when you look at it, you know, many geomas, which are brain tumors, thyroid cancer, uh, esophageal cancers, breast cancers, multiple myeloma, liver, gallbladder, kidney, you name it, pancreatic, ovarian, colorectal, all these are caused by obesity. So obesity is not only a risk factor for strokes and heart attacks, it is also a risk factor for cancer. So remember that. So what about stress? A lot of people talk about stress. The stress and uh, you know the cancer link are not so strong. Uh, a lot of studies have not really proven that stress is the risk factor, but definitely it lowers the survival in patients who already have cancer. So people who uh, have stress, they should actually uh, you know, try to uh, minimize the stress by working out, by eating right diet, by talking to people, by you know, developing healthy social relationships, things like that. So there are so many theories. I mean, it can increase the, you know, the cancer causing cytokines in the body. It can cause genomic instability. It can cause a you know, uh, lot of hormone release like norepinephrine, epinephrine, prolactin, you know, cortisol, which are all harmful for the body. So sun exposure is also a risk factor especially those who are fair-skinned individuals. Uh, if you're exposed to sun, there is a risk of melanoma and squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma. So it is very big risk factor for white people whose skin is fair. Uh, Dark-skinned people are not as prone, uh, but uh, you know the fair-skinned people, they have to be careful. They have to use sunscreen. Even dark-skinned people can develop uh, cancer. So it's always a good idea to wear sunscreen, especially uh, you know, when you're going into sun for an hour or more, like 50 SPF, sun protection formula, 50 or more would be good. So what about viruses? A lot of people don't even know that viruses cause cancer. And it is true. It's proven. Uh, and 17% of all cancers are caused by viruses and bacteria. For example, hepatitis B and C can cause hepatocellular carcinoma. We see that all the time. Dr. Gundala sees that too. Epstein-Barr virus, you know, it can cause Burkitt's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma. HIV can cause a whole host of cancers, including lymphomas, Kaposi's sarcomas. That's very well known. Human papilloma virus, HPV, can cause cervical cancer, anal cancer, head and neck. If you look at Cervical cancer, 95% of cervical cancers are caused by HPV virus, 95%. So some people consider it as a sexually transmitted disease. And human T-cell lymphotropic virus can cause lymphomas, adult T-cell leukemia. So these are all the viruses. Most of these are spread by what? Unhealthy sexual practices, right? Somebody has multiple sexual partners, if they are you know, doing without any protection, they can have all these viruses. That's why you just group them in lifestyle modification thing because you can change your lifestyle by practicing uh, you know, safe uh, uh, you know, protection, things like that. So this is very, very important to remember. What about coffee? A lot of people talk about coffee because this is also a lifestyle thing. So initially, there was a noise about cancer caused by coffee, but there are you know, some chemicals called acrylamides. And more research showed that actually it can decrease the risk of uh, cancer. For example, prostate, colorectal, breast, all these things can be reduced by coffee. But for that reason, do not drink excess coffee because you may develop palpitations and you may go to the ER or may have arrhythmia. So, one or two cups would be good. So, all right. So conclusions uh, about lifestyle and, and cancer. Lifestyle modifications are very important in preventing cancer occurrence and recurrence. Quit smoking, cut drinking, or even stop it if you can. Walk more, 
worry less, eat right, with less meat or no meat, more veggies and fruit, lose weight, sleep tight, protect yourself from sun as much as you can, beware of viruses. So one thing I always say, this is my favorite quote, and this is my own thing. You cannot change your genes, but you can change your lifestyle. That's in your hands. It is modifiable. Thank you. So let me, um, I'll take the questions at the end. And I'm trying to stop sharing here. Okay. Thank you. I request Sri Lata Garu to continue the session and Dr. Sri Garu. I think that's Murthy, you are muted and oh he came okay Murthigar, you are muted yeah okay got it i i don't know that he realized it yet dr murthy you're muted yeah, now, you know, somebody muted me forever. So that's why you're taking heart for me to communicate. Now I got <laughs> unmuted. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry about it, you know, technical glitch. Um, so thanks, Dr. Satish Garu. And it is uh, wonderful, you know, as usual. And every time uh, you speak about these things, you know, there is some always uh, some new information, you know, that uh, you provide even to the physicians. And uh, thank you for that. Thank you. But I think it is very important, you know, I think, you know, in a civilized world, uh, whether you are a physician or a scientist or uh, anybody, it doesn't matter. Uh, your credentials have nothing to do to know the basic scientific factors. And uh, that gives you a strong, a very strong impetus, you know, to do the certain things and lifetime modifications. So that's why I think you really have done a wonderful job. So now I think, you know, um, uh, I think Srilath Garu, Dr. Gundala, please continue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Murthy. Um, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Tana leadership, Dr. Murthy and uh, Dr. Uma Katiki um, for inviting me to this program. And I'm definitely feeling very privileged to be part of this group, to be able to talk about breast cancer awareness during the month of breast cancer awareness. And um, I do wanna say a big thank you uh, to Dr. Katula, my esteemed colleague who has done an outstanding job of explaining the risk factors, prevalence of cancer worldwide and laying the foundation for what I'm about to do. I believe this will feel more like a recap, um, but a much shorter recap. So without further ado, I'm just gonna share my screen and then we will get through it. Right, today my topic is breast cancer awareness. Um, and the goal of my talk is going to be a brief recap, as I mentioned, after Dr. Katula's very comprehensive and exhausting review of general prevalence of cancer. Um, today I'll be talking briefly about the cancer development prevalence in the United States, and a short preview of how things are in India, as well as the risk factors, treatment options, screening tools, and finally some lifestyle changes, and then uh, open to questions. So as mentioned earlier, the biggest question that we are trying to answer is what is cancer because only then we will know how to treat it. As Dr. Katula had pointed out earlier, um, this is the abnormal, uncontrollable, continuous replication of cells. When cell undergoes a normal cell division, we know that from time to time, 
some cells come out injured because of DNA damage. When that happens, that particular cell then undergoes death by a process called apoptosis. But you will see that in the cancer cell division, this abnormal cell is no longer able to undergo the process of cell death by apoptosis. Instead, it continues to replicate and it replicates in a manner that is 10, 100 fold sometimes, tends to then invade organs and then metastasize which is spreading to other organs. It is this process that defines malignancy and ultimately affects vital organs and causes death. And so how is breast cancer forming? This is a malignant tumor that develops from cells in the breast. These cancer cells can develop either in the milk producing glands called the lobules, or in passages that drain milk from the lobules to the nipple called the ducts. The cancer then spreads to lymph nodes, most often in the underarm or the axillary lymph nodes, and then eventually spread to the rest of the body from there. What are the statistics in the US? We know that about 13% or one in eight women are going to develop invasive breast cancer in the course of their life. We also know that there is a significant but lower, considerably lower risk for a man to develop breast cancer, and that's about one in 800. Breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in American women. And in 2022, it's projected that 30% of the newly diagnosed cancers are going to be breast cancers in women. However, it is good to note that breast cancer incidence rates are now decreasing. Since the year 2000 to 2003 alone, it has decreased by about 7%. The breast cancer death rates have also been steadily declining with an overall decline of about 43%. All of these can be attributed to early detection with screening as well as treatment advances. Breast cancer, however, still remains the leading cause of cancer-related death in women, second only to lung cancer. Risk factors, I think a lot has been spoken of it, but particularly related to breast cancer, a positive family history, such as one or more blood relatives with breast or ovarian cancer, genetic mutations such as BRCA1 or 2, previous history of radiation to chest wall, and then early menarche, which is the onset of menstrual periods in girls under the age of 12 years or a late menopause are all considered risk factors for breast cancer. Obesity and alcohol are the lifestyle changes that can increase the risk of breast cancer Older age or never having children is also considered a risk factor. Thankfully, we have good screening tools now. These do include breast self-examination, a clinical breast examination, mammogram, ultrasound, and MRI. So even with the lower rates of breast cancer now, it is important to be aware of any changes happening within the breast. A breast self-exam is a checkup that a woman can perform at home. So what do they need to look for? A painless lump in the breast or in the armpit, changes in the breast size or shape, sometimes even nipple changes such as retraction or a bloody discharge can all be signs of underlying breast cancer. There are also some of the rarer forms of breast cancer that can present without a natural mass. So it's very important to be aware of some of these signs. The skin can become thick, red, and look pitted, warm or tender sometimes with a rash-like look, or sometimes it may be mistaken for an infection. As we mentioned, Imaging tools have really improved the detection of cancers, 
especially in the realm of breast cancers. This is to show a normal mammogram on the far left versus the abnormal mammogram with the cancer on the far right. So the question that comes up also is when to begin screening. Depending on the age group, the screening tools can be different. In patients who are between 20 to 40 years, typically a clinical breast exam every three years is considered adequate, as long as they have only an average risk of developing breast cancer. After 40 years, for a person with an average risk again, an annual clinical breast exam, as well as an annual mammogram would be recommended. Again, the society keeps changing, but for the most part, practicing oncologists as well as the academic institutions would recommend annual mammogram after the age of 40. However, patients who do have an increased risk, either because of a family history, genetic mutations, and the risk when it is greater than 25%, the recommendation does include all of the above along with annual MRIs after the age of 35 years. So it is important to understand these risks. And part of the process really depends on how aware we are as clinicians, not just the oncologists, of course, because the first line is the primary care physician. So it's important to have that conversation with the primary care physicians about your own risk, depending on your family history. There are a lot of breast cancer myths out there. One of them includes women with a family history of breast cancer alone are at risk. We know that about roughly 70% of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer have no identifiable risk factors. Another myth out there is most breast lumps are cancerous. In truth, only about 20% are cancerous and 80% of these breast lumps tend to be benign. One common myth, of course, is regarding cancer in general, and that applies to breast cancer too. Breast cancer is non-curable. The truth really is that 90% of the early stage breast cancers are curable, often with just breast conserving treatments. So it is very important to note and bring these to medical attention as soon as something abnormal is detected. have um, an incidence of breast cancer, although much lower. Small-breasted women have less chance of getting breast cancer. There is really no connection between the size of the breast and the risk of getting breast cancer. And breast cancer always comes in the form of a lump. As we um, saw earlier, in certain cancers, such as inflammatory breast cancer, it may not present as a lump. Instead, it can show up as a rash. So it's important to note that patients who develop these kind of rashes or signs of infection that are not going away do have to be evaluated for cancer. So what are the treatments available? Treatment, as we know, it really depends on the type and stage of the cancer, whether the cancer is sensitive to certain hormones, as well as a gene called her 2 new if there is an overexpression, that also changes the kind of treatments that are given. In general, very often breast cancer is treated with multimodality treatments, and that would include surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, biologics, targeted treatments, endocrine treatments, as well as immunotherapy in certain kinds of breast cancers. Treatment also depends on the stage of the breast cancer. And this is a summary slide to just give a brief overview. Stage zero or intraductal cancer is typically treated with either removal of the mass or lumpectomy along with radiation or removal of the whole breast called mastectomy. Stage one and two cancers similarly can be treated with the lumpectomy with radiation or mastectomy along with some sort of lymph node removal. And then based on the tumor characteristics, 
either hormone therapy, chemotherapy, or biologic therapy can be considered. Similarly, stage three is also treated in a multimodality manner. Stage four cancers are the ones that would have metastasized or where the tumor has actually spread to the rest of the body. The treatment here is primarily systemic treatment by which we mean either chemotherapy or the targeted or endocrine treatments. And radiation and surgery are only utilized depending on the patient's symptoms or other issues. So this is the question that always comes up. Um, Dr. Katula did a fantastic job of explaining what are the modifiable factors and the non-modifiable. So I'm gonna give you a very brief overview in terms of the modifiable risk factors. Obviously the discussion about obesity was very comprehensive. So reduction of weight is definitely valuable in decreasing the risk of occurrence as well as recurrence of the breast cancer. Similarly, exercise plays a major role as well as the balanced diet. For this particular audience and for all of us who have come from India, we have loved ones in India, friends and family, and it would be extremely remiss of me if I did not discuss the state of cancer care, particularly as it applies to breast cancer in India. So what are the statistics? We know that even in India, it is the most common type of cancer in women. The incidence is about 180,000 new cases per year. About 13.5 cancer cases in the entire population and 26.3, which is over a quarter of the cancers in women in India would be breast cancers. More than 50% of Indian women suffer from either stage three or stage four cancer, which is a little different from here, where the detection of cancers tends to be at an earlier stage. And the post-cancer survival reported in Indian women is only 60% as compared to 80% in the US. So what are the reasons for these numbers? Clearly there are obstacles in providing cancer care. These obstacles do include awareness, cost, access, availability of technology, as well as quality of care. Not to mention India with a population of 1.38 billion people is projected to have a need of 5,000 oncologists. However, as of 2018, only 1,500 clinical oncologists are present. So what are the opportunities to improve cancer care? First, cancer care is an initiative that was developed by the World Economic Forum in February of 2022, with the overarching goal of this initiative being solve cancer for India, we'd be able to solve cancer in the world. And I believe that is true for a country as large and diverse as India, if we can actually help with the cancer care, that would help the entire world. So how do we go about doing that? The cornerstone of this initiative involves AI, telemedicine to improve the access and quality of diagnosis and care. In 2018, Ayushman Bharat initiative was launched to deliver a comprehensive range of care for all healthcare services. And the Pradhan Mantri Jen Arogya Yojana also provides financial assurance for secondary and tertiary care for the 40% households that are considered India's most marginalized. In summary, breast cancer can be cured if diagnosed early. This is the month of breast cancer awareness. <clears throat> And I'm also happy to inform that my own practice, Hope and Healing Cancer Services, will be supporting this initiative in India by providing virtual consultations. Um, appointments can be made through the website, hopeandhealingcare.com. And anybody that requires assistance you know, can call the following phone number as well. And with that, I will close. 
And I do want to thank everyone for inviting me. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gundala. Thank you very much. So it was an excellent presentation and it truly compliments, you know, uh, the presentation of Dr. Satish Kattala because you have truly gave um, um, the factual information about, especially about the Indian women. So uh, what I would like to do is to have the questions and answers. And um, I am not able to see any questions and answers. Uh, so uh, where can I see? Uh, Dr. Uh, we can ask, we can ask Andy, I can see because I'm the host, okay. so, and okay. Hema can, yeah, we both can ask them, and thank you, Mutigaru, thank you very much, yeah. and the first question we received is, does sugar has any role in <clears throat> breast cancer, Dr. Shri? So that is a very common question that comes up. As with most of the lifestyle changes, we know that the refined sugars can cause multiple problems. Um, there is no direct link, as far as we know, between refined sugar and breast cancer, but the overall process of carcinogenesis can occur, um, as Dr. Katula has pointed out. And so from our standpoint, we do request all of our audience to continue those changes in their diets where we promote complex carbohydrates, legumes, and lower amounts of refined sugar, um, as well as processed foods. Yes. Thank, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Hima? Shrigar, there's a question for you on the breast cancer. We generally hear that Asian women have um, dense breast tissues. How far that is true and uh, is that related to any kind of, of course, the breast cancer? So the uh, primary issue with the dense breast is the lower detection rate that is of concern. And the way that we get around that is to promote the 3D mammograms or the mammograms with TOMO. Um, per se, dense breasts, as far as we know, does not mean that the incidence of cancer is high. The issue, as I mentioned, is most often related to the detection of the cancer itself. So a combination of uh, 3D mammograms or mammogram with TOMO, as we call it, along with MRIs, have been successful in identifying those cancers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This question is to uh, Dr. Katula. How close is research to identify primary cause of cancer? Oh, we know the primary cause, you know, it's the DNA mutations and, and that the DNA mutation could be due to so many risk factors for every organ, it is different. For example, lung, it's smoking. And for breast, you know, there are so many risk factors as Dr. Kundala mentioned. Uh, so, yeah, we know a lot of risk factors, you know, we know about smoking, we know about alcohol, we know about diet, all these things. So we do know the risk factors, we know what causes cancer. So some we don't, for example, glioblastomas, and there are some cancers we don't know what, uh, what caused them, but, uh, but a lot of cancers we don't know, we don't know the risk factors, yes. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Um, and there is another question, uh, Srigar, this is for you. What is the other common type of cancer found in women other than the breast cancer? Is there any specifically other than breast cancer, commonly type of uh, cancer? Are you talking about just incidence of uh, other cancers in women beyond breast cancer? Yeah, generally, uh, what is the other common type of cancer other than the breast cancer in women? So the common types of breast I'm sorry, common, common types of cancers outside of the breast would include lung, colorectal, ovarian cancers. Oh. But beyond that, obviously there are there is incidence of other cancers as well. Okay. Thank you. So another question is to Dr. Katula. Uh, one 
cancer does using steel by bar non stick utensils cause cancer i mean there is no big data to support that i mean it's just, there is nothing much you know that uh, you are getting out of that uh, you know uh, it's it's um there are some uh, you know uh, what do you call uh, some noise about that but nothing has been proven so thank you and this question is to dr uh, shri during periods for women the hormonal changes causes severe severe breast pain is it common does it need to be checked So we know that uh, breast pain associated with menstrual periods can happen. Um, it, it is fairly common, uh, but if it is a persistent pain that does not change, I think then it definitely it needs to be evaluated. Okay, okay thank you. And uh, this question is for Dr. Katula. Can you explain the side effects of the treatment and cancer treatment? Yeah, it depends on the treatment. It's like, uh, you know, you have chemotherapy drugs and every chemotherapy drug, you know, has a different, uh, you know, side effects, specific side effects. For example, adriamycin, which can affect your heart and it can cause leukemias uh, and, uh, you know, taxol, uh, which is paclitaxel that can cause neuropathy. Oxaliplatin can cause nerve damage. Uh, but in general, the cancer treatments, chemotherapy can cause nausea, vomiting, mouth sores, hair loss, diarrhea, low blood counts, infection. Those are all the common things that are caused by, you know, chemotherapies. And the immunotherapy has a different type of side effect profile. For example, uh, it uh, enhances the T cell immunity. That way it can cause immune mediated reactions. For example, uh, liver damage, uh, kidney damage, low thyroid levels can cause colitis. It can cause what is called pneumonitis. They're all immune-mediated uh, complications. And there are some targeted treatments uh, which can cause some other type of side effects. For example, skin rash, diarrhea, you know, prolonged acute interval. So it depends on the type of thing. Every, everything has its own side effect profile. Uh, but uh, in general, the treatments are much... Uh, more tolerated nowadays, including chemotherapy. You know, for the one dreadful chemotherapy drug is cisplatin. Uh, we, we use that still in some cancers. And uh, people used to be admitted uh, because of the nausea caused by cisplatin, but not anymore. Uh, and so we can watch for that. And uh, you know we do give a lot of uh, medications uh, to prevent nausea and they do work like charm. So uh, nowadays we are not seeing that many side effects, fortunately. And uh, thank you, Andy. And again, question to you: uh, cost of the treatments, how much? How much does it cost? These the are uh, really expensive, uh, unfortunately. But fortunately, covered by a lot of insurance companies. Uh, majority of the patients, 90, 95 percent of them, are covered. You know, so even some of them are uh, like in millions of dollars. Some of them are like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and uh, for example, oral treatments every month, uh, some of the treatments may cost fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per month. And there is something called CAR T cell therapy. It uh, each treatment costs about nine hundred thousand dollars. But uh, fortunately, you don't have to pay from your pocket if you have good insurance coverage and all that. But in India, also, you know, a lot of them have some coverage. Uh, you know, through employer or something, but, uh, you know, good number of them don't, unfortunately. And uh, uh, that is a problem. Yes. And in India, they have their own version of the molecules and they modify molecules and they have their own things, uh, their own drugs there. By changing uh, the molecule a little bit here and there, they come up with their own drug and they try to, you know, make it available for cheaper price. But it's an issue, uh, you know, drug costs are, are going up and, and uh, it's a totally different uh, debate. Uh, but yeah, they are expensive. Yes. But all older treatments, for example, you know, gemcitabine, those who are generic are, are cheap still, so. Yeah. Uh, this question is to Dr. Shri. We heard you saying early menstrual cycle below 12 years has a risk of breast cancer. 
what caution can we take to avoid? That is your question. As Satish was mentioning earlier, some of these risk factors would be considered non-modifiable. And those include, you know, when menarche happens. But on the other hand, there are lifestyle changes, avoiding alcohol, exercise, all of these would be of benefit. Um, beyond that, of course, you know, it truly depends on what else is going on in the life of that person. While early menarche is considered a risk factor, if the, you know, if the person does have children and does breastfeeding, that is considered a, a help. Somebody else also asked a question about dense breasts. As I mentioned earlier, you know, the thought really right now is the detection is so much more difficult. But when you think about it and the anatomy of it, we talked about the breast cancer actually originates in either the glands or the ducts, right? So if a breast is considered dense, it's primarily because there's not more fat in it. It's all glands and ducts. So that's one of the things that perhaps, you know, is Um, you know, breastfeeding is done, those glands and ducts remain active as opposed to being sedentary in a sense, right? That they're not in function. That itself also appears to help in decreasing the risk. So breastfeeding in these patients can help, you know, lifestyle changes can help. These are all the modifiable changes and things that a person can do to help themselves. Thank you, Andy. Our next question to Dr. Katula. Based on historical analysis, does gen genetic uh, cancer spread to daughters or sons major majorly? Are there any food habit changes needed for vegetarians to prevent it from cancer? Well, uh, there are genetic causes of cancer. Certain cancers can run in families, you know, breast cancer, you know, melanomas, kidney cancers. Um, all these things can run in families, um, certain types of pancreatic cancer, even brain tumors too. So yeah, um, I mean, there is nothing uh, much, I mean, other than lifestyle change. And, and uh, for example, if somebody has family history of breast cancer, they have to have screening from earlier age than recommended age and uh, getting, you know, mammograms done and then MRIs, you know, if it is breast cancer or something. Uh, so vegetarian diet is always good for many, many things, uh, you know, including uh, cardiovascular risk, you know, heart attacks, strokes and whatnot, as I mentioned before. So the vegetarian, it's not only the vegetarian diet, it's also how you eat vegetarian diet. A potato is potato, fries are fries. A potato is not fries, fries is not potato. They come from the same thing, but the processed food is, is not good. So non-processed, you know, whole plant-based food is, is good. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Hema? Hema? Yes, similar question, Andy, about the family thing, whatever you just mentioned, Satish Garu. So I think we are good on that question. Too. Yeah. So what is the question today? It's about how, what, what is the, um, you know, how do we have to be cautious if it runs in family? Like, you know, <coughs> it can be immediate father or mother, but it can be, if it can be somebody as the grandparents also can have. What kind of precautions should we take if that happens? Yeah, just I like think, I mentioned. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. yeah. Let's hear about. So, uh, I'm just going to add one more thing in this regarding breast cancer. If there is a fam strong family history, we would recommend that the patient be sent for genetic testing. And if any mutations are identified, um, prophylactic mastectomies or even oophorectomies would be offered. Um, and then surveillance truly would depend on the kind of genetic mutations that are identified. Or oh, there is a genetic test which can be doable, uh, Shigaru? Yes, so it, for patients specifically with breast cancer, 
there are definitely uh, some genetic mutations that are considered very high risk for the incidence of breast cancer in their lifetime. Um, I think most of the audience may have heard of Angelina Jolie undergoing prophylactic mastectomies as well as oophorectomies. So BRCA1 and 2 mutations, as well as a few other mutations such as CalB, all of these are considered very high risks for developing breast cancers and testing can be done for them. Okay, thank you. That This, this is really useful and that having that kind of genetic test, that's really great. But uh, yeah. not uh, every person, for example, if the per family person is like 70 years of age, 80 years of age, those are not familiar cancers. It also depends on what age the parents or grandparents develop this cancer or are they just one cancer or multiple cancers? That depends on a lot of things, but generally speaking, as Sri was saying, we can do some blood tests to find out what kind of gene profile they have. Exactly. So I totally agree with Satish. It really has to be a very strong family history, multiple family members affected, as well as the age diagnosis that really matters. So if there is a concern for a strong family history, they should definitely discuss that with their doctor. Okay. Thank you, Andy. This, uh, this question is to Dr. Shri. Um, breast cancer reoccurrence score is 42. How bad it is likely to reoccur after five years? So I want to clarify, when they say breast cancer recurrence score is 42, are they talking about an oncotype DX? Uh, perhaps they did mention, Andy, that just uh, I got that question. So when they mention a score that is a recurrent score, very often it is in the setting of an invasive breast cancer that is hormone receptor positive. It depends on the age of the patient and the menopausal status. And a patient who has a high recurrent score that is considered greater than 25 is considered to high, have a high enough recurrence risk that chemotherapy would be offered along with endocrine therapy. So I'm basing this answer truly on the premise that this is an oncotype DX recurrent score. Okay, thank you. I have one more question, Andy. Does using plastic containers has any relation to cause cancer? So um, I know that a lot of substances are being looked at. I feel like I should give this to Dr. Katula to answer because this is a generalized risk based on plastic containers and lead. Um, but I, you know, I'm going to digress a little bit before I hand it off to Satish. One question that really often comes up to me is the question about soy and associated estrogen levels. And is there a link of increased cancer or recurrence in these patients. Uh, interestingly enough, it looks like they've finally studied it and that it does not appear to have a link of increased risk of breast cancers. So I'd like to just throw that out there. I'm sure that question always comes up. Um, now I'm gonna hand it to Satish to answer the general question of plastics and lead. <laughs> <laughs> That's not proven in uh, studies, and there is no strong link. Again, you know, there are so many rumors about that, but nothing has been proven that plastic causes cancer. It's not good for the environment, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Generally, we talk about plastic containers, and we will put it in the microwave. The, it causes cancer. That's what we. No, the on. microwave also. There is also a misconception about that uh, because uh, microwave is. There are two kinds of radiation: ionizing and non-ionizing. The cell phones and with microwave, you get what is called non-ionizing radiation, which is not cancer causing. But ionizing radiation, for example, the one which we treat patients with if they have cancer, that can cause cancers the people who have you know these uh, x-rays done or people who are exposed to cosmic radiation for example people who fly a lot uh, the million milers and the pilots uh, you know if they are uh, flying you know in the atmosphere they're exposed to what is called cosmic radiation so that radiation is not good but uh, the microwave 
there's a very weak link between microwave and cancer uh, causation. So uh, ionizing radiation is bad, not non-ionizing ionizing radiation. So there's also a thing about cell phones all the time. People ask, you know, do cell phones cause cancer? But uh, the fact is they don't. Thank you for clarifying that, Andy. <laughs> Thank you very much. And this question is the last question, I believe. This is for uh, Dr. Shri. Are there any specific exercises we need to do daily for women that helps to prevent the breast cancer? So I believe it was the Women's Health Initiative um, that included the MET levels of exercise. But it did not define what the different kinds of exercises they needed to be. They just needed to be um, enough to, I think, increase the heart rate to a certain extent. So any cardio exercise is considered good. But on top of it, you know, there's no specific exercise, particularly just for breast cancer that I'm aware of. Um, Satish, if you want to add to that. No, there is no specific. You kind of become the lifestyle guru right now. <laughs> Any physical activity is good, as long as they avoid sedentary lifestyle. Um, but as long as they are you know, not even cardio, I mean anything that they do, aerobic exercises or just walking or uh, swimming and and uh, taking your dog out for a walk, any type of physical activity actually decreased the risk of recurrence by about thirty six percent. Actually, that's more than wow. any chemotherapy. That's a, that's a very interesting number uh, because, you know, being physically active is very, very important, but it doesn't matter which type of physical activity. One last question, Andy. Yeah. I know we talked about the family history part. This is the other side of the question. What is the percentage of getting cancer if it is not in the family history? Like if we don't know in the family history at this point of time, but how, what is the percentage of getting without in the family history? Most of the cancers are, they don't have any family history. 70 to 80% of them do not have family history. And if you take 100 cancers, only 20 to 25% are genetic. They have family history. Wow. The majority of them don't. Majority of them so don't. If you have family don't. history, you have much more higher chance of getting that because you have family history plus you have the general risk factors too. So your risk is higher, definitely. But if you do not have family history, and most of them don't, but still you can get cancer, yes. Thank you, Satish Garu. Okay, Andy, no more questions. So uh, I would yeah. like, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Andy. Thank you very much. This is uh, really fascinating, you know. Um, I learned a lot too, you know. So a couple of questions, you know. Um, number one, the nulliparity, nulliparity as a standalone risk factor, because there was some information, uh, if I remember correctly, a few years ago in Lancet, that uh, everybody is going nuts in nulliparous or multiple ovulatory cycles, and that should be suppressed with um, the hormonal treatment and all that. So what is your take on that? Okay. Nulliparity, what is the status? of the nulliparous woman getting higher incidence of the um, breast cancer, number one. The second, which is uh, not quite related, the role of turmeric, especially for the prostate cancer. You know, there are no studies yet. And in fact, prostate cancer, you know, as uh, was alluded by Dr. Satish, you know, it is nobody, you know, we have come all the way around. You know, you know, uh, the total prostatectomy, lymph node dissection, everything is gone. And it is just like the so-called Halstead procedure we used to do about 30 years ago, it's such a mutilating thing for the breast. Now there is so much of refinement. But my question is, you know, uh, this is of course a technical thing. Gleason 6, Gleason 6 is considered as a low grade, a low grade, low grade, maybe, maybe not a true cancerous lesion. So I want your expert opinion because I want to take this opportunity to improve my general knowledge too. So these course, two questions. So I appreciate if you can answer them. Thank you. Three, you want to take the first one? I'll take the second one. <laughs> yes. Do you want to go first with the second one? I think that it was a long question. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, you are right, Dr. Murthy, and we overtreat, uh, you know, prostate cancers. Uh, you know, that's why the PSA can be really bad. A lot of times you detect very low grade cancer and, and a lot of people, if you take uh, prostate out of people who are more than 60, 65, 30% of them do have cancer. But not all of them die from cancer. They die with prostate cancer. They die of something else. So the low-grade cancers, it's better not to touch them, in my opinion. Uh, you know, treatment should not be worse than the disease. So in Gleason 6, that's what happens. You know, patients undergo the surgery and the complications arising from that. You can simply watch it. You can simply watch the PSA uh, and, uh, you know, do uh, scans or the digital exams, rectal exams and things like that, rather than acting upon it. But anything more than seven or eight, yes, we should act on them. So coming to turmeric, uh, there is no uh, data to support that it's anti-cancer. It's, it's anti-inflammatory. There are some studies which have shown that it is as potent anti-inflammatory drug as ibuprofen. So it can actually decrease the pain as much as ibuprofen and arthritis. It can decrease the inflammation, but is that enough to prevent cancers? We don't know. But I agree with you. I think it will be a nice uh, observational study to do but that takes, you know, years, maybe a couple of decades to really know the effect of it. So I hope I answered your questions. Uh, you did. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Silata, do you have anything else to add? Otherwise, uh, uh, the, the nulliparous thing, you know. I, your nulliparous thing is the one, you know, that the, yeah, adding to turmeric, I was asking. So nulliparity, I think, you know, is your question. Uh, uh, can you please um, throw light? Yeah. So, Dr. Murthy, I think your question was, how does nulliparity affect the incidence of breast cancer? And it is considered a risk factor, an independent risk factor. Um, I think the thinking behind it is in patients who do have children, there are changes within the mammary glands and the ducts, which decreases the incidence of that cancer. And so in the absence of that, I believe that is considered a risk factor. Similarly, nulliparity is also considered a risk factor for ovarian cancer because of the unopposed ovulation cycles, um, and that can be an added risk factor. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you both. And uh, Dr. Uma, uh, you are on. No, please, your concluding uh, remarks. Thanks yeah. again. I really enjoyed today's uh, moderation. Appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. Appreciate that. Thank you so much, Dr. Murthy. And first of, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Kundala and Dr. Kathula for attending this, for, for accepting our request and attending the session. And uh, Dr. Vemuri Puntigaru for uh, moderating the session. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank um, our President Tana, President uh, Sri Anjay Chaudhar Lavgaru and all the leadership for their constant support. And... Uh, Last but not least, I would like to thank all our audience um, for attending this uh, very informational, uh, very important and informational session. And uh, I would like to thank Hema too for co-anchoring with me. Thank you so much, Andy, everyone. Thank you very much. And I'm concluding this session. Thank Goodbye. you so much, Andy. Thank it's you. a great opportunity to meet you all. Have, a great, you. have a great night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Andy. Thank you.